right on time. Uh, okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, good evening or good afternoon to those people online. Uh, welcome to this session, 10 recommendations for data repository to improve data discoverability. And uh, this session is organized by Data Discovery Paradigms Interest Group. Uh, Catherine Bridget over there and the photos and uh, myself are co-chairs of this interest group. Unfortunately, Catherine couldn't be here today, but she also put a lot of effort to organize this session. So thanks, Catherine. Um, let me move ahead. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we have a collaborative notes in this bit.ly URL, or you, if you have your mobile phone, then just uh, scan the barcode. Um, please put your name into the participant list in the uh, in, in the notes. And uh, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in Zoom chat. We will have photos or Bridget keep in the chat zone, or you can put that in collaborative notes. Um, this session is being recorded. I'm not sure if the recorder just stayed in the whole room, but uh, just be cautious and the people on, uh, on, online, if you don't want to be recorded, you can turn your camera off. Okay, here is the agenda for the session today. Uh, I will give quick introduction to the group. There we always have a new um, new people to the group and then uh, give a quick introduction to these 10 simple roles we have been working on for a year now. And then we have Uwa from um, Tangier to give a presentation how they implement things along the 10 roles. Um, then we have plenty of time to get your feedback on 10 things. So this is supposed to be a work session. Uh, looking forward to your contribution. Okay, and um, I'll give a bit of introduction and history of this interest group. So this interest group, Data Discovery Paradigms Interest Group uh, address the fundability um, in the FAIR data principle. Uh, in the fundability principle, you can say in the sub-principles, metadata are reg should register or index in a searchable resource. But the data discovery is more than that. You know, how reports are going to index, how users search, um, uh, data that's uh, not covered by FAIR. So that's this group are uh, trying to address. So we think there are three key players in this um, data discovery. Uh, sorry. First and foremost, you need a user. Otherwise, what you develop your data reports to reform. So users um, come, they are research need, need a search for um, so, so, uh, search for data. And then they interact with data discovery surveys, trying to achieve that goal. Meanwhile, we have data providers. They collect data, curate data, and have data described and registered in ca uh, data catalog. And uh, this data discovery service could be human front interface or API or other service to supposed to as uh, mediators between user and uh, data providers uh, as an interface to, to um, help to animate each other. So this group, interest group, um, we have a chart like any other interest group uh, has. So our objective for this interest group uh, to provide a forum where representatives close the spectrum stakeholders and the roles, like three roles I just talked about, 
can explore shared issue of how to improve data discovery. And the second objective is to produce actionable recommendation for each of those uh, stakeholders in this ecosystem um, to improve the data service. And uh, that's our objective of the interest group. And uh, we started uh, in 2016, so a little bit of history here. So data discovery paradigms is a very broad topic. We um, uh, consulted members, members put up a topic, they are of interest. We also consider who can lead each topic and drive that work. So we started with four task forces. Um, one is guidelines for make data findable, and the second one is collect the user cases, prototyping tools, and the test corrections. Um, and the third one is metadata enrichment, and the fourth one is um, um, relevance ranking for data discovery system. And out of that uh, four um, task force, we um, uh, generated uh, three supporting outputs. So first one, 11 quick picks for finding research data. That's more, um, could be used as uh, training tools for researchers, uh, the tips for them to find uh, um, data beyond the keyword, like a Google search like. Yes, um, search is a skill and librarians have been trained um, lifetime to do that. But now Google, uh, it's all Google-like. That's not effective for data discovery. So this could be used as training tools. And the second output is uh, um, we, collected about uh, seven, nine user cases. These use cases are available on Zenodo. And based on these user cases, we analyze the user's requirements and make recommendations. Uh, just for the difference, this recommendation here is more from uh, for the user and the search features, discovery features. So what kind of features should be there to support those user cases. And uh, uh, the number here, so it's outdated. <laughs> Please forgive us, so we didn't update that. And the third output is a survey of current practice in data discover surveys. So one key finding from that survey, um, many participants of the survey, I think there are about 101 or 104 of those. The, uh, the you know, under resource is just, just the plug and play um, solar or elastic search engine without knowing how to turn and optimize the models to meet the user need. And they recognize the importance, but uh, under resource or in-house expert to do that. Uh, it would be nice if we have an expert on board to, to, to lead that work further. So that's the um, out-of-pocket card. Um, so, so after that, the three task force finished, we also we also take off um, two working group, research metadata skimmers and uh, data granularity working group. This research metadata skimmers is more about how do you back up your metadata in schema.org and uh, put that structured uh, metadata onto the a metadata landing page, so that can be more discoverable by web search engine or more improbable, interoperable with other data repository. And uh, these two working group or both um, produce their output. Please check the web page to to yeah to see the recommendations. So um, a year. Uh, Two years ago, we started a new uh, 
task force called user study task force. And I think two words I hear from this conference so far is to know you are user and the context of we doing things. So this is exactly this user study group about. So we start about say, well, there are so to know the user, what is the method or methodology uh, we could recommend. Then um, we understand there are already um, many studies there from practitioners, from researchers on how uh, users search for data. So we started as recommend, recommend the methodology. Then we also synthesize the research and the practice from other um, interviews, surveys to recommend uh, what is the best practice there. So from there, uh, we developed 10, 10 uh, roles. So first one is to know your user. So we recommended the most used um, uh, method um, to, to, you know, from survey interview to log analysis, um, how this could be used to know your user better. And uh, the other study also indicated many repository traffic are from web search engines and also in literature search. So how can you improve your repository presence in web search and also in literature search? And also now we have, you know, if people search for data, they usually you know, know where the data to go from their own discipline, but if beyond their discipline, they um, don't know much where to go. So how do we support the uh, search for both disciplinary and the interdisciplinary? And also support a broad term to narrow terms to, to someone who knows the field and who not know the field, um, how we support this beha uh, search behavior. And also the issues of duplication. Um, nowadays, the repository um, keep a close harvest with each other. So users usually don't search from one repository. They search several repositories. So when they put a query, they encounter the same record again, again, and again. So how do we handle that duplication issues? And also um, for the big data set, how do we search data within data? And how to know users metadata need. We try, you know, to describe everything, but we under limit resource. So we need to know what the data attribute are most important to the user community you are serving. And also how to improve data uh, metadata quality and uh, um, uh, and describing a way that could, uh, could support the linked data and the knowledge graph that can support a complex um, data discovery queries. And then lastly, well, not least, um, to include a persistent identifiers in metadata record so that can trace um, provenance issues and support the knowledge graph. And uh, here um, are 10 things we discuss now. And I shall welcome Uwa to introduce us the Pangea's uh, experience um, of along these 10 things. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. So let me check. OK, hi. Um, I wanted to present uh, about how Pangea has implemented those uh, 10 simple rules. Um, and first, a uh, short introduction for all that don't know Pangea. Pangea is a data publisher for Earth and environmental data mainly. And we are already available since now approximately 30 years already. And it's hosted by the Alfred Wegener Institute and the Marum. And we have several accreditations like the World Data System, Quadra Seal, and so on. Uh, we have a team which spans multiple, uh, multiple um, universities or other research institutions. 
we have data editors and we are mostly um, also funded by Helmholtz and so on. So this is just a short introduction, but now um, what rules did we implement? So um, here is, Here's just the overview, and um, as you see, most of them are already done. Uh, there are only some some of them, like number eight and number nine, which we are still working on. And uh, be because we are not really um, cross-disciplinary, we are cross-disciplinary repository, but um, we we don't have any support for users searching in a other uh, disciplinary in an easy way. But I want to come back to some of those uh, rules here, which I want to focus on today. The first is that you know your user, because uh, we also have measured what our users are doing. Uh, the second one that I want to present in a short way is the number five, which is so, uh, support for broad terms and uh, so to support searching in um, in in from somehow terms using from the top level although in your data set which may have very very detailed information and uh, the last one I want to talk about is seven search data uh, within data and that's um, mainly the first one so know your user um, Pangea itself, to track our users, we are now using Matomo. Previously, it was Google Analytics, but this doesn't really matter um, because you get more or less the same information out of it. Uh, what we figured out at Pangea is it's a little bit different that was said in, in the paper already. So we found out that half of our users at Pangea are entering uh, as a direct entry, so they're entering uh, the URL or using bookmarks. And this is followed by the people coming directly through search engines like Google. And the last one with, where we have many, many, um, uh, many, many people coming from is journal article pages of journals where they are clicking in the reference list or the link uh, to the data set. So uh, the, the stuff is a direct entry. So here's some statistics. It's only the last two days or something like that, that I'm, I added here. So you see here, the direct entry is 48%, but you have to be a little bit careful because many people now turn on their privacy in the browser. So you won't really see where they are really coming from, though I would say a large part of the direct entry could also go to search engines and websites, and the websites are opened here, so you see here, that's what I said previously, uh, a lot of people coming from www.nature.com, so this is obvious that this is mostly coming from uh, from journal articles. The same here from Orchid, Orchid Profiles, Gepco is one of the geosciences, uh, they have map data available, so they are coming from there, where there are links to Pangea in that case. So actually, but search engine is still 30%, I would say maybe I think it's 40% because you don't know it in most cases, though that means most people are searching using Google, so it's very, very important uh, to get uh, your data into all those other portals. Uh, so you you should not invest only in your own search engine. So you should also try to get everything into Google um, and other search engines. In our case, although um, our our information is, for example, also going to Thomson Reuters uh, for the citation counting, the Ixo World Data System, Data One. So metadata is uh, is is also harvested by them and used for search purposes, but. The most important uh, one here is, uh, of course, Google. So we are also appearing in the Google dataset search because we have schema.org metadata, which is very, very detailed in our site because, interestingly, the Pangea metadata schema, although it's already 30 years old, is very, very similar to schema.org, at least from the concepts you see inside and also the structure of the metadata. So this works very, very well. So you see most of the information there. So the second one that I wanted to talk about is support data searches from broader terms to narrower terms. This is going more to the Pangea search engine because Google cannot really use it. They have their own mechanisms uh, to do that. But on the Pangea side, um, we are trying to do that. I have here a simple example. Uh, 
uh, where I want to show what's going on here. So for example, uh, the user has entered here a very, very strange term. I say it, it is strange. It is some term about um, plankton foraminifera. So it's something which uh, has to do with plankton. But actually, this term is very, very special here. It's called Rhino. Uh, I don't see it. Rhino Cospira. And if you look that up in a terminology, um, you see here that actually this term used here by the end user is not even uh, the official term of that uh, type of species. I think it's in that case, it's a genus. So it's an unaccepted name and the correct name for that is Globigerina, for example. Which is, uh, which, if, so, so if you would enter Globigarina into the Pangea search engine, you would find the same search case. So the first thing is what you need to do is, um, if you have the information from terminologies that you expand, uh, your search index with, for example, something like we call it synonyms here in that case. But there's also another thing. So, um, when I'm going back here, uh, as you see here, um, we are also showing here on the left side facets like zooplankton, mixoplankton. So that means this is a very, very broad term. It's only a genus. There may be different species handling about that. So actually, the data sets you find here below there are not only about that specific genus, they are also about species from that genus. So something like a specific zooplankton. Um, so the user now have the possibility to drill down in the search results because uh, you have the more narrower terms here, like uh, this one belongs to zooplankton, mixoplankton, it's bentos in general. And this information is all coming from worms, which is uh, that, um, that, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, terminology. We have other ones for chemistry, uh, and that's used. But how does it work in that case? So if you look at the metadata information here, you see here that, for example, our measurement parameters here was something like the D18O was measured for this Globigarina boloides, which is a specific species. And we have that information annotated with a term, which is coming here from marine species, which is also from worms. And if you look at that one here, then it gets really complicated when we are indexing the whole stuff. We are expanding that parameter here by all the broader terms, which are uh, which are available. And you see here, there's also this special term, rhinoscopira. And this is the reason why the user actually finds the data set. The term rhinoscopira is never there, nowhere mentioned in that data set, but it's still shown. So actually, when we are indexing the stuff, we are collecting all those terms. And interestingly, also, we are using that for the topics. So we are using that to show that on the left side in the facet information. So for example, we added the term automatically that it's about this one is about biological classification. So that's something uh, which is very important for your own search engine um, to, to implement that. And uh, so you're, uh, you're really invited to look into terminologies because it, uh, because it really helps you to do that. Finally, or not really finally, I wanted to go to uh, se the seventh rule, search data within data. Uh, that is mainly about, you often have different granularities of data sets, like um, in Pangea, you have a single data set, which is, uh, which is uh, just a table about the information like you have seen before, like that uh, species measurement. But there are sometimes uh, different collections in Pangea where you have uh, uh, something like a bundled publication. So you have different types of measurements. Uh, which are only usable if you see all of them together. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, each of those data set is still be usable alone if you are only interested in that type of data. So actually, if people are discovering data, um, they can be very specific, only search for terms which are in, in, in one of those data sets, but it's much more interesting uh, for them also to find the collection data set which which somehow offers the user the possibility to download all the data uh, related to his work. And for that to work, uh, so mostly this is important for bundled publication. Um, 
uh, which is uh, and which is a concept of you're putting together data sets uh, from different types of measurement into one or publication series, which means it's a long series of publications. Uh, so measurements every year you get a new data set with more or less the same structure. And if you want to know more about that uh, tomorrow in the afternoon, there's a complex citations working group where this is mainly covered. But what we are doing here in Pangea is we replicate the important concepts from the child data sets into those parent data sets. So you can also search for them. Um, we also put the variable level metadata and the observation event metadata in the parent collection. So basically that's the same like the first one, but it's specifically for the variable level metadata and the event observation. So if you're searching for this Globigorina D18 O count, you would also find the parent data set. And another thing about searching text uh, data within data is that if the data set itself contains text, so that means uh, if you have a data table and there's some information like comments in it, or you are listing all the species you have observed at a specific point, then this is also put into the search index. So users will find that information. And uh, we also have something which is, uh, which is uh, for the discoverability, because in most cases, people are more interested in those collections than in the single entity data sets. And because of that, we give uh, those data set a slight boost in, in the ranking, so they will appear first in the search results. Unless the user is too specific in searching, then he will, of course, get the, the exact data set he's looking for. But if it's more the general terms, you always will find uh, the, uh, the other data sets. So that's basically um, everything about that. And the last one here, the rule three is tell your users about uh, this article, I ch just modified it a little bit. This is about how to correctly cite uh, data in uh, in your uh, in in articles. So have a look at that paper. It clearly shows how the uh, how the user should put together their reference list and data availability statement. So everything also gets in the search indexes of the journal article. So your data is referenced from the journal in a correct way, and users discovering the journal will go also to your data set on your data center's web page. Like in our case, as you have seen, many people are coming from nature in our case. So that's all from my side. And now I'm handing over to... Yeah. Was that too so fast for you? <laughs> okay, yeah, I want to test. Um, um, is this, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Um, any questions um, uh, to Uwa? Uh, it, oh <laughs> Hi, I'm Rita from National Library of Finland. We also do some of the kind of search engine stuff. Uh, I wasn't completely sure did I get everything right from your presentation, yeah. but um, that part where you um, sort of you seem to index um, kind of like the term and it's kind of like parallel terms and kind of like parent terms. For yeah. It. How how much that impacts your kind of index size? Because always when we talk with our tech guys, they are like we need to be really yeah. careful about our index size and discuss how. So I'm, I'm kind of that that idea sounds really awesome. So I'm I'm yeah. curious about that. <laughs> Actually, actually, it does not really uh, it it affects the index size. But uh, actually, what what you know is those broader terms are uh, there are so not so many of them because the cardinality is lower. Because um, in that case, the broader terms are always affecting more more data sets. So the number of terms is not growing immensely in your index. And uh, the important thing is we don't store that information inside. Uh, inside the index uh, data that is returned to the user, we only have it in the search index, those broader terms. And in that case, it doesn't grow too much. It grows, but it doesn't really uh, hurt your uh, response times in, in a great way. The other possibility, by the way, if you want to do that is also if you just have synonyms, you can also do instead of indexing it during the indexing side, which is also more static and uh, requires uh, when you have updates in your terminologies that you do a full re-index of, uh, of the whole index. The other possibility is, of course, to expand. If the user enters a term like that, expand it 
uh, at query time. But unfortunately, this does not scale for the use case of broader terms, because if you're entering a very, very broad term, the number of narrower terms below that is immense dramatically. So your search query will get something like 100,000 terms or something like that, which does not work and will slow down you much more. So actually, the general rule for full text search engines don't care about index sizes. An index with, uh, with 10 gigabytes doesn't matter. If it's 100 gigabytes, it also doesn't matter. It's the same speed. No real problem in that because of the structure of the inverted index. Index size doesn't matter. Thank you. Um, any question from online? No? OK. So we have one more question here. Hi, Lucas van der Meer from the Netherlands. Impressive work, thank you. Um, I had a question about the broader terms. Yeah. Uh, the user finds a term that they didn't, uh, that doesn't appear in the data. I can see why that is beneficial, but it could also be confusing. How do you deal with like the provenance so that the user knows on which yeah. uh, results the hit is made? Actually, the, the, the first thing is, um, if, if you're searching for the broader terms, they are always lower ranked. So that means the first search results you see will always be the more exact matches. That's the first thing. So the user, at, at least when they are clicking on the first search results on your web page, unless the term is really that special like this one, um, it's, it's, um, it's complicated. They will always see the exact terms first. So uh, if they're searching for the correct term like Lobigarina, they will all see all of them which are uh, which using that, for example, in the title. So for example, titles also boosted up. But if they're going down through the long tail of search results, they might be interested. But in my opinion, it doesn't really hurt at that kind because if they don't are not interested in that result, they won't look at them at all. The problem is for them to afterwards figure out why this was a hit match. So normally you would do something like highlighting in your search results, but the, that really doesn't work for, for, for that case. And the problem with highlighting is also it doesn't work with structured out data in any ways. So because it's hard, you can only highlight terms, for example, in the abstract, but everywhere else is, is very, very hard. So actually this is a problem. And I think this is also discussed in the 10 rules. But in my opinion, uh, you should still do it because it's it's better than giving the user nothing if they are having something like a wrong. So we are also doing something like if you are entering and have some typo in your search terms, it will also uh, show you some search results. So that's basically uh, the rule. So it's it's hard to explain to your user. And I know scientists are very specific. It's different to a shop at Amazon. Nobody asks why this is a search result. They're happy that they found their product. But uh, this is a little bit different with uh, data. I agree, that's a problem. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, next, we will get into the discussion session. So uh, last plenary, we uh, had a extended extensive discussion and a feedback following the bottom five rows that help us to progress the writing up of um, examples, principles along of each rows. And uh, this time we reverse back, we um, get the top five that uh, didn't get discussed last plenary, uh, give them preference to discuss further. So, um, yeah. I think I should share my screen now. yeah. So yeah, yeah this works. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. So the focus will be the discussion of the <laughs> Is it possible to also share this on this screen somehow? Yes, there it is. Awesome. I don't like seeing myself. So um, as being father said, um, we are moving now into the discussion part of the of the session, which means that we will be asking you to do something, not just listening to us. Um, the document itself is here. If you look, if you look in the link or scan the QR code, you will end up in this particular document, um, which, as you can see, has enough information in there. 
But what we really want is to make sure that we reach a consensus about what all those points are. So what are we going to do now? Um, we're going to go through each of those rules, starting with rule four and moving forward, um, to get some feedback from you on what is missing, if it makes sense, if there are any arguments or counter arguments on what is actually currently listed. Um, so I'll start directly with rule four, which is this one. So the rule itself, um, if you go to the document, its name support both disciplinary and interdisciplinary data search. In practice, it is uh, the motivation of this rule is essentially to support researchers where they want to actually use multiple data sets at the same time, um, or to want to um, start using data from an area, from a discipline that is not necessarily their own. Um, in, the, in the era where um, complex systems and modeling um, is becoming more prevalent, I think this is becoming even more um, important. So the main reason for having this rule is essentially to ensure that these interdisciplinary teams or research can actually work effectively. So what do we recommend here? Essentially, there are six points, uh, five, sorry. The first one is about uh, making sure that repositories um, allow the wider community to, to know that it exists, which is easier said than done, usually, uh, but it's something that we need to actually work on. The second is that um, given that the goal is to support this interdisciplinary use, um, the actual repository, the actual um, uh, information there needs to be defined in a way that um, other disciplines can effectively use it, which it means about metadata linking, um, ensuring that there is a common vocabulary, um, common way of, of, of accessing the information, which leads essentially to the third point, which is about um, improving the metadata quality, interoperability, and usability. In other words, making sure that you don't have the one meta schema that is uh, metadata schema that is specific for one repository and not possibly being used anywhere else. Um, the other two are essentially ways to support search from the users. One is to allow for specific disciplinary terms and general terms to be used in a particular context. And the second is to actually allow for some for a range of data discovery entry points so that users that come not necessarily from the specific background can actually effectively use that. In practice, the way I interpret these particular points are that if I end up being in a in the Pangea uh, repository, which I'm far from familiar, I have no idea what's in there, um, as a outsider of the discipline to be able to at least know how to navigate and how to read information given that, that I have a particular reason going there in the first place. So um, with that, I will have a short pause here and I would like to take your feedback or your ideas on this particular rule. What is may missing? If it makes sense, if there are counter arguments, I will leave this for the time being. Um, and also your own experiences, like what do you do with your own systems and these sorts of things, like best practices. Yeah, we have over there. Practice the reference, uh, please uh, speak out or put in the in uh, in the collaborative notes. Hi, Vim Hugo of uh, Dance in the Netherlands. So one of the things we've started exploring in terms of uh, supporting multidiscipline search facilities is to create multiple indices on the same catalog with different sets of vocabularies linked to the basic metadata. So I'm quite interested in whether that resonates with others and uh, whether we think this is so a way to go almost as a standard way of supporting multidisciplinary search. My concern is that if one keeps on adding vocabulary into the same metadata record, it's going to become very messy you know, across multiple disciplines. So it's probably simpler, at least in our view, to have multiple indices on the same, same catalog. And as Uwe said, those, ind those indices cost nothing, basically. You can make as many as you like. That's super interesting. Uh, can you maybe elaborate on how you distinguish for the users which 
index they're currently e using. Yes, so we, we're aiming to make it selectable. So if you come to a search facility, let's say from archaeology, uh, you would link vocabularies describing different uh, uh, historical time periods, for instance, to the time or the temporal coverage, mm -hmm. Bronze Age, Iron Age, whatever. Um, but those terms are not useful to people that want to use the same data set coming from a non-archaeological discipline. So there we then aim to link different uh, kinds of uh, vocabularies to them. So I think that's you, you need to be able, I think, to, to allow users to select the perspective they want on the metadata catalog by choosing an index. Any other comments or practice you want to share? Mostly because it's very quiet. Um, I'll flip the question. Um, is there anyone that feels strongly that this rule doesn't exist or it doesn't uh, should exist or it doesn't make sense or are there any strong arguments against the point that this is raising. As you can imagine, what we try to achieve here is to have to reach a consensus on those rules. So if there are any strong feelings against those, it might be useful to capture them early on. There is a comment here um, <laughs> which says, what would this look like? Um, I honestly don't know is the short answer. Um, the example, oh, uh, there is a hand there. Okay. Right. So um, I'm, again, far from an expert. What I would imagine as a, as a user um, is that it will allow me to have a simpler interface, a simpler way of interacting with the repository to retrieve information that it's far from my expertise. How this can be linked to my expertise, to another metadata schema, for example, I'm not sure how it can be effectively done. Um, but again, I can easily imagine that for a particular data set that I have, I want to link information that is not necessarily tied to that. The easiest example I can give from my experience is connecting metagenomic information, which is hard sequence information, to climate information, which in theory are not directly connected. So you need to find a common index to retrieve information from one repository to another and link them ultimately. Again, the takes time, but that's kind of one effect that I would see here. Uh, please go ahead. But just to continue on that, we, uh, I'm Jane Zeller from the British Oceanographic Data Center, and with our sister organizations, are looking at the data commons with our other environmental data centers. So we have our own vocabularies, they have their own vocabularies across the terrestrial, we have our marine, and the, it's the commonality across that as opposed to we all have our own individual, and, and the differences that we apply to that commonality. So taking that commonality as the, the basis from which to build out from. And I don't have, have you considered how that applies to to the interdisciplinary process rather than just vocabs upon vocabs upon vocabs? It's the commonality that then builds out. So I think actually this is like the most common way of doing this is that, for example, you are a discipline specific repository, but you also uh, provide a crosswalk to um some of the more more common vocabularies for the, the i think the classic example is to to just map everything to data side which you have to do probably anyway to get your pid and then uh use that to also generate your, your schema.org and and other other things that then allows you to to go into the the bigger uh search engines such as uh, google dataset search google itself of course and and open air and all these things so i i think this is like like from my personal experience is like most probably most the uh, most common way of, of doing that um i i think the, the 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 example that was given for dance is much more interesting to see like okay maybe we have two very distinctly different communities that we have to serve and how can we do that and and i 
I, I have to say I'm really intrigued about that one. <laughs> um, there's another point being written right now, um, which is make sure that all your metadata is machine readable and follows common standards. So other metadata portal can ingest your metadata, which appears like a way that you can connect different repositories with. But again, it comes back down to what is the common vocabulary, possibly. I don't know. But just to make sure, um, let me see if there's a question there. Um, sorry, there is a question from Martina. Um, it wouldn't must multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary support be covered by ensuring to be present in other search means, aggregators, Google, et cetera? Um, that, that is basically what I just said. So this is, this is I think, the most common way of, of implementing that, to, to not actually provide two different views on your data yourself, but to rely on aggregators to provide the inter interdisciplinary um, search for you, basically. All right. So just to make sure, because for all the comments so far, it's mostly clarification questions or implementation questions, more or less. The premise of the rule appears to be valid. No strong objections either way. That is good. I see people nodding, which is usually a good indication. All right, which means I can move to the next rule, which is rule number six. So the sixth rule is about how to handle duplication. Dupli Sorry. Um, so the motivation, as you can imagine, is that uh, we need somehow to reduce duplication, both within a repository and across repositories, because otherwise you might have different paths leading to the same object or different paths, again, leading to the same object across different repositories. Um, so this is one of the challenging ones, implementation-wise, at least. Um, so the recommendation here is that the repository itself should provide a means internal structure of identified duplicates. So if I were to deposit the same thing twice, the same repository, it will be identified somehow. So that's the one thing. The second is, even if you don't have that in place during um, submission, um, you do have a process of agglomerating these duplicate records when retrieving information. So again, having them at the same time and see that, well, I, this is the data that you requested. This appears to be duplicate. And then, and if you start looking across repositories, you have the question of um, having these persistent identifiers also across the metadata records across repositories, which is has its challenges, but at least it will definitely make it easier to identify these um, records. And the second one, if there is a repository building on other repositories um, and more specialized that or additional information um, to ensure that the original data is linked in a way that allows this kind of um, provenance um, to be captured without necessarily replicating the exact same information twice. Um, so these are the four recommendations in this particular rule. And as before, um, I will open the floor for any strong thoughts, objections, counter arguments, missing points, basically anything. So we have something in the in the note document which says that the title of the rule is um is vague. Okay. Um <laughs> uh can you maybe give like constructive like the how do you think it should be better? So what's the title again? Handle duplication. Handle duplication, yes. Uh well, the actual rule we have in the document is just duplication. Duplication, yes. <laughs> so I don't know if it improves the situation or not. Yeah, I I think one of the earlier uh, um, ways to to name this was deduplication, which also, but but um, especially for example in the in the case of versions, I don't think it always makes sense to actually always just delete the the duplicates you have some way to handle them like like you have to deal with a problem and not, not necessarily just throw away everything that looks like a like a twin so that's why we we kind of changed that uh um yeah um it's a different thing i think when we have uh two data sets with the exact that are actually identical like they have the same dui and everything but but then of course 
um, um, yeah, P PIDs are, um, I, I, in, in our repository at least, we have a, a couple of cases where the same object would actually have several PIDs. And then that also, uh, you know, just we don't want to just play that five times just because it has five different PIDs. So this is another thing. Um, there was a suggestion to call it a handle duplication of objects. Okay, maybe can we get like a, a nodding or shaking hats, Paul, of the people <laughs> here? Is that better or or worse? So I see some shaking hats, some are nodding. Okay. <laughs> Is this working? Okay. Oh, okay. So, um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> I would like to, to make a suggestion for that. Um, so um, there are two levels here. So... Mm -hmm you may be discussing first the PID, if mm -hmm. there's duplication of PIDs, and second, uh, duplication, or maybe three, even, <laughs> duplication of metadata, and third, duplication of objects, the resource itself. And um, yeah, for, for all of this, I think there are pros and cons and discussion for years now about that. And um, I just read an article um, from V3 Data, I think, uh, where they uh, commented on repositories going out of business. And uh, this is the most um, uh, yeah, compelling uh, argument for duplication <laughs> because, um, yeah, if you, can't, um, if you can't resolve the PID anymore, <laughs> then... Uh, I think uh, duplication is a good thing <laughs> first uh, to, to at least have the object. But um, I agree uh, that a duplication of PIDs is stupid and shouldn't be, <laughs> shouldn't be the way to do this because people get confused and they don't know if it's the same object or if it's different. And uh, even though DataSite uh, data has a solution for that in their uh, metadata schema, um, because they know this is a problem, um, they then uh, try to to solve this by it is uh, identical to this or that PID, but this is just a workaround, I would say. And uh, so my question would be, which kind of level are you addressing or do you address all of those three, maybe? <laughs> well, I can answer for myself. I have no idea what would be the, the group decision here. Um, as a user, which is my main role here, to be honest, um, I'm mostly interested in, in the object itself. Um, it is extremely often placed in, in, in bioinformatics and life science to end up having the same entry appearing twice with slightly different metadata and, of course, different PID. Um, which is problematic because it's duplication of the actual data with the metadata slightly, well, the, we can find differences, but they are mostly semantic differences. Um, so if there was any sort of drive from my side, I would really be keen on avoiding like duplication of the object itself. Um, but that's just me and I definitely have my own biases there. So I don't know. Um, there was also the, the suggestion to actually just handle the duplication on the search interface level, which I think also makes a lot of sense because uh, one of the things that I that are not very good for the users is that they type something in and they get 20 times the same result. And that's just not very useful. And that even is true if, if it just looks like to be 20 times the same result. It's actually 20 different versions of the same document of the same object. Okay, we have one more question. Okay. Okay. Or, or you, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I have the power of the mic. Um, this is just a suggestion for the rule name instead of handle duplication, because actually that makes me think we're duplicating handles, the PIDs. Oh, okay. Um, is just reduce duplication. And then from there, within the text, you can decide, are you talking about duplication of PIDs, metadata, search results, all that sort of good stuff. Thanks for the suggestion. Um, 
and I guess they, they are also micro microphones down the back. So, but anyway, is there any uh, question online? No, but there's a yeah. question there. Yeah. yeah. Not a question, more like a example from a slightly different context. Uh, in a library context where we combine uh, kind of like materials from multiple libraries, for example, multiple libraries have books. The, the, we do the deduplication in a way that in a search we show them as the one item. And then on the actual material page, we show the metadata and the materials of one of them but we saw that hey there are this like 10 other sources for it and then if you switch the source you can see the metadata and the particular sort of information coming from them so um it could work in this context as well so then it would kind of in a search you would find it as one item but then you could uh, check that what's the differences between the uh, different <laughs> um versions of, I don't know, duplicates. And, and if there's some differences like version or something, then you could pick pick that one. But for then for finding purposes, it would be just one item. Thanks, that's a, um, possibly Google data set search does. So then under the same like a method of report, then list the few data providers can access uh, that data set. So we have example in the document <laughs> how to do that. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Um, that goes first. <laughs> sorry. Hi, uh, Andrea Persch, a meta Helmholtz metadata collaboration. I um, can talk of the experience we made in the Geodaten Infrastruktur Deutschland, mm -hmm. SDI, Spatial Data Infrastructure Germany. And we want to have duplication of metadata because we take them all and rank them in the portals we say in the different federalism portals and uh, we uh, know which one uh, is the newest the youngest one with a date stamp mm -hmm. and with a um, location the uh, metadata was uh, um, distributed so it's uh, it helps to pre-process the uh, hits and the duplication of objects that that aren't uh, allowed only the one who's the uh, the owner of the object can talk about it and do the metadata and there's it, it is, isn't allowed to duplicate and if you do so you must uh, do a second metadata set, which take uh, care about the original ones. And the third one, the PIDs, um, uh, they are done by UU, UUIDs. I don't know the long, long version, unified <laughs> identifier. <laughs> it's uh, 32, uh, sagt man, capitals and uh, numbers. So it's safe, it's made uh, automatical and the, uh, so yeah, sure, there are not, no, uh, not a second, uh, I would say PID, so. Thank you. Mostly, so before we got to, to get that question, um, just to make sure, um, does this mean this approach that we, well, this is a way of handling duplication in the first place, right? It's not that we actively encourage duplication. I, I'm, I'm slightly confused because now I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we want to avoid duplication or if duplication is actually a positive thing that we need because it helps other stuff. Well, if possible, it's better not to have <laughs> duplication, but now it's unavoidable to have a duplication. If that exists, how do we deal with that? All right. Fair enough. This is why I think we, we changed it to uh, handle duplication because yeah. duplication is not always, strictly speaking, a bad thing. It's just that, that in some scenarios, like, for example, search results, um, it can be um, well detrimental to the users. We have more questions. Yeah. Uh, there's a question there first. Sorry. Ah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, just yeah. a quick comment on this. That I think the, the problem here is not so much that one uh, cannot handle or deal with duplication. 
but that there is often not enough information available to arbitrate between versions. Mm. So there's sort of best practices needed for people who make duplicates of objects or harvest metadata, or in many cases nowadays, mint a new persistent identifier that reuses part of another identifier that's already been minted that occurs more and more frequently and presumably for good reasons. So the duplication is not going to go away, but we need to establish best practices in for people who duplicate objects, harvest metadata, mint new PIDs pointing to the same object and so on and so on. Yeah, I wanted to say almost the same um, has a title, for example, deal duplication, deal with duplications, manage duplications, because they will appear in the workflows um, in some in some way. And so, um, as you said, best practices wouldn't be bad. I like that word, manage it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can people online hear us? Can people? Um, um, I don't see any comment. So there was a comment about naming, um, which is handle duplication of search results, which yeah. I've already pasted here. Uh, there are no questions online, but they are. I think they are pasting some things on the um, yeah on the chat. So for example, that was what about duplication across different registers and repositories? But we are addressing that while we we, okay. we move ahead. Yeah. Um, wait. Oh. oh. oh um, sorry. Um, the link to the collaborative notes. Sorry. Yeah. So for, for... the last one was handling, not handling. What was the last? Managing. One? Managing. <laughs> Managing. Uh, for people online, if you want to speak out, uh, just raise your hand. We will see you, and uh, then you can have a voice. Um... All right. So just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, I don't see any major objection against to this rule again. Most of the discussions were about the implementation aspects and how to better clarify what the motivation is in the first place. And I think this is also thank you for highlighting what the name was. I really mm -hmm. did not get that part. Um, and there is also some articles that are popping up here about duplication discussion that we probably need to have a look at. Awesome. I'll move then to the next rule, which is rule seven. So this was a challenging one to deal with. Um, it is called search data within data. It's a bit of inception. Um, so the motivation is, as the name implies, how can we search about data within the data itself? And the question is, for example, um, the study level information versus the well, variable, for example, versus the metadata. Um, the, there are like a few recommendations here. The one is to have sort of a comprehensive annotation of the data itself. Um, because you can describe the actual object, but occasionally you actually need to describe also the, the individual variables that comprise the object, um, which may include data type, transformation, a dictionary if it exists, um, any kind of additional vocabulary that may be associated to that. Um, the second point um, as a recommendation is to um, allow or to support machine learning for automated metadata extraction, which it's kind of a slippery slope because there are some issues that may pop up in there, but it's a way that we can facilitate this kind of data search within the data. And the last one um, connects also to the granularity, this kind of the granularity effort is to allow for the interface itself to search not just at the object level, but also within the object. So defining different levels of granularity, while searching for the information that lies in the repository. So um, with that, um, again, short enough rule, um, it's time to open the floor for any points or objections or thoughts about that one. So um, my name is Maria Esteva and I work at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, University of Texas at Austin, uh, the Design Safe repository. So, in the Design Safe repository, which is a natural hazards engineering repository, we store large data sets coming from simulations, experiments, field research. And these are multivariate, multimodal data sets, each of them. So, we have um, devised, we have 
put a lot of effort in interface design and data model design, which maybe hopefully in the future can be the data model and the metadata could be um, used for machine learning. So to extract these categories, but simply stated right now, the interfaces tells people what different basic components of all experiments or simulations are. So you will have a categorization where you store your model configuration for an experiment, then the sensor location for that experiment, then all the events are distinguishable because you can align them with these categories that are colored in the interface. So interface design, because most, a lot of repositories, you just present a blank, you know, a blank list of files, or uh, sometimes you can um, add them in folders, but still that is uh, is not standardized. So it depends on how the user organizes the data and if they do a data dictionary or they put the file naming convention that they use, so it could be very disorganized. So in this natural hazards engineering repository when we went by data types i'm not saying this is ideal but data types and then different research methods and distinguishing the different sub collections i would say or events or inputs outputs in a simulation or collections in a field research um, campaign that you can distinguish um the data components and people can navigate through that. That is an excellent example. Um, I would have loved to put this as an actual example in this particular rule. Okay, I'll, I'll find out first, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this didn't work as well. <laughs> Something like that, sorry. Um, yes, please yeah. go ahead, sorry. Hi, uh, Ethan Welty from the World Glacier Monitoring Service in uh, Switzerland. Um, I actually wanna push back here maybe a little bit. Um, I don't quite understand the inclusion of, um, for example, in the, in the main slide that, that it would be searching within data data within data to have in, uh, to add, to describe what units, what columns in the table, for example, are present and what the units are, if that's what I'm understanding here. This seems like critical information that needs to be at the upper, the top level metadata for this data set. Um, either way, if I don't know what, what the columns are and what units they're in, it's a useless piece of data in many ways. So I'm confused how this, it seems like this is just this goes into just describing the data set in a way that makes it reusable to other researchers and interpretable. Um, so I feel like there's kind of two things going on here. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something. Um, and it seems like if we're gonna talk about searching data within data, so basically really the content of the, of the data set, uh, then it's about, I guess, providing search interfaces in place uh, so that the users don't have to download the data and then open it in software. And it's basically saying, like, can we, you know, make it a, a goal for a repository to provide more user-friendly interfaces? Um, so, um, um, I think for many disciplines, it's actually common practice right now to not actually provide uh, all the column names of the data set within. And then, of course, the users say, oh, but we need those. So this is actually something that's very common. Like, for example, if you go to OpenAir or Google Dataset Search, you will not find the name of the columns uh, in, in as part of the metadata description. Sometimes you, you have that as a little bit of a high-level information there. Uh, like, oh, this contains data about, I don't know, rain, but you wouldn't know, like, what kind of rain or whatever. So, uh, yeah, this, so there's one thing. <clears throat> Um, but the other thing is, uh, I, um, I don't know if we want to give a recommendation that there will be actual data exploration tools as part of the repository as sort of like a must. Um, 
because this is something that that can be like we experimented with this but but it's really like um this is like an, an open-ended problem and and it, it, it quickly becomes a red race between your repository and what kind of um, features you offer and um, and what, what commercial companies put out that also offer this sort of services. So, so we eventually opted for just better integration with other services that would just already offer this sort of data exploration. But I, I do, do realize that other people have very different experiences with that and um, I, I think it would be interesting to know how everybody handles that. I guess, yeah, I agree that that's a very high bar to say, okay, you, you must provide interfaces for every file type. Um, but I think, I guess I would like to see in this document somewhere that we just, you know, as if, if, if I think of data repositories and um, as sort of, to some extent, an opportunity to, to tell research data generator, publishers, creators, now, this is the opportunity where you can really intervene and say, okay, think about the person trying to reuse this data set. What do they absolutely need to know? You know, at least if it's limited to your field um, that you're familiar with, like then if if we don't have a list, I don't know how you can describe the columns without listing them. And it seems like this is core piece of the information. And it doesn't have to end up in all the indexers and data catalog reusers and republishers but um if it's not written into the to the metadata uh when the data is published by the data creator who's the only person that really knows this information then that's the only opportunity we have and it's gone um i guess yeah as a data user i'm incredibly frustrated by the how these crucial pieces of information are still not ending up um alongside the data so I guess I don't know where it goes in these 10 rules, but if there's one about <laughs> making the data actually useful to your colleagues, um, yeah. I think maybe some sort of, um, yeah, a checklist or sort of some, some amount of curation that goes into pushing for better, more comprehensive uh, metadata. Um, I think there are some some aspects um, that are also related to the to the disciplinary um, search because if you want to if if we now want to search in the in the data we know we need to know who wants to search in the data what disciplines want to search in the data so it might get also here really really messy and you need to know as a repository provider okay we can we can offer until that point we can offer like maybe a general search in the data for for the purpose it the data were meant to be produced that were produced with but then you need to know, find the point really when you have to maybe externalize also an index for example so if they and that is not the the general index for the general search the multiple scenario search for example if you maybe um a search the the searching also needs to be done with a certain approach you know okay i might find in this group of data set the data set i want but if you're doing a research you know okay um for example um you might find the the data measured in 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 uh in the in these pan signs in the facilities but what you really want to know is uh what happens to a motor from a from a certain manufacturer uh what happens to the motor during a time and so on so on you will not never find this in any of the the, the search indices and then you want to search in these data um so here uh when when you when you separate um what is generally offered to the to the public and what you want to have cited um in the normal um repositories and when you create maybe an extra data set from this data so there the here you might also need an approach for when you um separate these these indices and these repositories and so on thank you uh one last one um question comments because again we need a move on okay. I would like to echo the importance of this uh, recommendation, but also um, I wanted to clarify or ask for clarification whether this 
deals with the data or with the metadata? Because the other recommendations clearly distinguish between the two. And I think that's very important. Um, in the social sciences, almost all data is um, is a closed data, whereas the metadata, of course, is open. If this relates to the metadata, then I'm all up for it. If it relates to the data, then it's a much more complicated story to me. So um, I think we're talking metadata here. <laughs> As I said before, like, like we could also offer a service that, that would allow people to really have a look into the data, but then we run into the problem that there already is, exists specialized technology for that and replicating that as part of the repository um, that, that seems to me outside of the boundaries of the you know, separation of concern. So that would be my my short answer to that. But uh, of course, um, if if there are other opinions on this, please speak up. <laughs> oh, there you go. There is also two points that came on the chat, so I want to just yeah. mention two. Um, the first one is about um, as an technological approach to suggest an API approach in complementing the mm -hmm. user interface to search and exploring data. Uh, but the second one, which really resonates with me, is that uh, Rule 7 might ap be applicable, um, might not be applicable to all types of data, which is what uh, Brigitte just said about mm. the metadata. Um, it is hard in this case for the humanities repository to enable search within 3D files or unstructured text based documents. Um, so there the question is which part of the information is part of the repository, which is part of the analysis. So if you're talking about extra information from an unstructured document, it is data within data, but then is the expectation of the repository to provide that, or is it part of the analysis that's going to be after retrieving information from the repository? So it's a bit of a... That, that is actually uh, uh, an interesting um, point, because on the one hand, you want the users to be able to identify whether or not the document uh, the unstructured text is relevant for them, but on the other hand, um, necessary just just providing full text searches um, might be a bit too much. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, one last comment. Cool. Also, maybe just some thoughts on including data into the search facilities. So um, well-behaved data sets in earth and environmental sciences and biodiversity generally know which variables are involved, uh, what the units of measure are, maybe even the methods that we use to determine the, the variable and so on. But as you move into other disciplines, that's just very rarely the case. Um, uh, in humanities, for instance, there's no real discernible variable even sometimes in a data set. So I think the sensible approach again is to create some kind of graph-like analysis of what's available in the data itself, taking restrictions and privacy concerns and whatever else into account, and then to use that to extend the indices for specific uh, um, uh, disciplines. And that's sort of the, the, the approach that we want to follow uh, at DANCE. Thank you. Um, this, as a, what is said earlier, this, the most challenging rules we encounter ways. And so because of time, um, if you have any comments, please put um, into the collaborative notes. And uh, for this, we have 12 minutes left. For two do you, rules. Pardon? For two rules. For two rules, okay. We can do it. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, um, rule nine is the easiest one. So that's why I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is about improving the metadata quality and the linked data. So the motivation, as you can imagine, is that essentially for any kind of rule so far, in all the discussions, the quality of the metadata is the key role. If you don't have sufficient quality there, things break. Um, so the recommendation, um, have a particular schema and a standard of a camera that is completely backed. There is a strong support there. At the record level, to ensure that um, the metadata reflect the information in the data set and again, be as complete as possible, which really corresponds to talking about rich metadata. And finally, the syntax level, make sure that there are, uh, you make kind of a check, a validation of any syntax error so that any issues of interoperability, usability of the metadata is captured early on and you enrich the information as much as possible moving ahead and maintain the information. 
I think again, that's the simplest rule. So I'm not really worried, but thoughts, any strong arguments for or against or something that is missing? I maybe project my biases here, so <laughs> I don't know. Everyone wants high quality metadata. Yes. Cool. Okay. Good rule. <laughs> <laughs> and again, the last one, I would still hope there are going to be no more strong arguments. Include identifiers, PIDs. Um, so the PID is a bit of a kind of question whether we should put them as PIDs or just leave it as identifiers. So again, the motivation, make sure that we identify, disambiguate and link relevant objects together. Um, the recommendation here is essentially a list of relevant identifiers that can be effectively used. So the DOIs for its input outputs, the ORCIDs for the researchers or for institutions, um, the other ones, don't ask me, I am not familiar with those, but people who are much more clever and wiser than me have put it in, so I trust them. Um, so here, essentially, if I go to the document itself, which might be more useful, um, the actual section here is about all the different PIDs and how they can be used. And these are recommendations. So what I would argue um, as a particular rule here to make sure that identifiers that have been um, promoted by the wider community are extensively used are explicitly listed so that people are becoming aware of them. That's kind of my sort of expectation here. But I already saw a hand somewhere back there and a hand in front of here. So there might be arguments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, just a simple uh, suggestion is that we include suite to include the uh, software identifiers. I can see you smile there. <laughs> Yes. Uh, hi, Stefan Kramer from American University. Um, I have not seen this done in data repositories, but uh, Mark Parsons made an argument yesterday that I agree with that one could argue for using ARCs, archival resource keys, as PIDs because they can represent a hierarchy and you might have um, a study in a data archive that consists of multiple data sets that are of a hierarchical nature. So that's ARKs. Sorry, I have a lot to say this morning. Um, the other aspect, of course, is once you have selected and linked these persistent identifiers to relevant elements in the metadata, it's very difficult actually for machines to find those links if you are not uh, following some simple rules. And there's emerging recommendations or processes for that. One that we're following uh, and I've implemented in Dataverse now is called signposting, which basically gives you a sort of shortened machine navigable uh, pre uh, summary of all the links in the header. So you don't even have to access the object or the metadata for a machine to be able to find all these uh, linked identifiers. That's um, Matt Mernick from the National Center for Atmospheric Research in the US. This is a general comment about all of the rules. I think this is a good rule, but um, we heard in a Pangea talk about uh, some user stats that showed that the majority of users, perhaps the large majority of users, enter the repository from the middle, not from the top. They don't do searches, they go through Google, the direct links. And so I think a comment for all of these is there's a standpoint issue here where almost each of these rules can be interpreted differently depending on if you're coming from the top or from the middle. Uh, right. If you're if you're starting from the from the middle of the repository on a landing page, you might interpret these rules differently. And I think the same uh, sort of point here about standpoint are these rules for people or for machines. They might be interpreted differently. So I think for all of the rules, I think it's going to be important to sort of identify the standpoint to know that there's different standpoints and sort of mechanisms for getting at this information, and that there might need be different interpretations of the rules based on those standpoints. Okay. 
Hi, I have a follow on with that. And that's also, especially for PIDs, is who are they for? A researcher doesn't care what the actual ORCID is or the DOI or any of those. They just want to be able to get to it. So if you have them, clearly, you know, they're a PID, they're going to be linked. But in our repository, we never show things like ROARs. We never show anything like that. So the users don't have to think about it. One thing that I'd love for us to do within our repository is take a key from a lot of library catalogs where you can click on like a librarian view and you can see the whole, what we call mark record that has all the information in a weird code that a lot of us weird librarians know. Um, but a user doesn't care and shouldn't have to parse that whatsoever. And in the case of a data lib or a data repository, that would be where all the links are. The PIDs are for weird specialists and machines. So we don't need to be exposing them as much as uh, a lot of uh, repositories do. Um, and not on that, but then you need real clear how to cite it. As a user, I usually use the PID to find the citation data. So how do you get that? So within our repository, we actually have a cite this data. So it's a button that pops up something, and then it's also at the very bottom of our landing page. We explicitly list how we want it cited, and that does include the PID. That's a part of a citation style. Uh, I think you're partly correct. Uh, I, I think PID are actually essential for uh, our uh, uh, endeavor to have complete metadata, because they are the key to the redundant data that we all share on people, on institutions, on instruments, and so on and so on. And uh, as that, I think if we want, and we always talk about automated metadata filling in the, of the, our fields, we can only do this with PIDs. Without PIDs, we're lo absolutely lost there. So I think they're not only for machines, they also ease the life of the people who are um, uh, 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 providing us with their research data, with all this uh, reference data. And we need to have clear rules on who is responsible uh, to maintain the PIDs, who registers them, who maintains them, uh, who um, uh, who makes sure that they're actually tied to the data. And um, uh, th that requires much more than just the researchers and the repositories. The repositories enable that. But for example, uh, technicians need to make sure that their instrument data is uh, somewhere in the instrument PID, which is upcoming now. You know, so I think there's a very big field uh, that we need to explore in uh, connection with the PIDs. And we're just at the very beginning of uh, exploiting um, uh, the real potential of those. Thanks. Okay, so there is a RDA PID interest group. So <laughs> we can pass on the message. I didn't introduce myself, Cécile uh, Suetek-Kassafir from uh, Nanterre University in France. We need to be very aware that many parts of the planet cannot afford PIDs. For example, in Europe, you might know the continent. In Greece, they stopped having the uh, National Committee for ORCID. And in Latin America, they are using ARC. So thank you to the uh, Sheffield colleague for raising this. So we should be very aware of the uh, financial model that this implies, because here, maybe I have an entrepreneur state of mind, but I see um, a very good opportunity. I would like to respond to that uh, about the costs of PIDs. Uh, also, who is responsible? Is that the research community or are those the data providers? Uh, if the data providers are outside the community, for instance, uh, companies or uh, public agencies, is it fair to let them pay for the PIDs, whereas the researchers are the one that benefit from it. So in the Netherlands, we're looking into the model to let the research community pay those external organizations for minting their PIDs and help them with that. So um, I, I want to uh, echo that the costs are very relevant in the PID discussion. Thank you. Uh, we have one minute left. So what do you want to do for this? <laughs> <laughs> so, one minute left. 
it's up to me. That's fun. Yeah. Um, so I think we actually reached the end of the rules that we did have to go. Um, the other ones we managed to go through when we had a discussion or last plenary, which is quite useful. Yeah. Um, what I would start by saying is I would like to thank everyone for joining. Um, could you, and... Sorry, Walters, could you go to last one? Yes, so... of course. You're right. We have an important one to call for co-chairs. Ah, <laughs> I wanted to go to that point. So essentially, okay. I would like to thank everyone for actually joining. Um, as a follow-up action for everyone here remotely and everyone who is actually connect the group, um, we will still try to finalize this document, hopefully finalized within this year. Um, so there's one more outcome of the group. But more importantly, um, as RDA also recommends, um, we need to start um, transitioning from the chair's point and have new chairs joining this group. So this is an open call for co-chairs who might want to step forward and take a more active role in leading this group, um, joining us here. Uh, we meet um, every third Wednesday of every month. So if you want to be involved, even if you don't want to be a co-chair, this is an open discussion. Please join the group. You'll get the invite so you can always be there. And the idea is, again, to move this forward, start discussing after we finalize this document, what will be the next steps of this quite long-lived interest group, I think. So with it, um, thanks, everyone. Thanks again for the speakers and for everyone who contributed today. And we'll be in touch.